thank you. And I, I switched the title around a little bit. Um, and and um, I'm trying to not pull the plug, by the way, while I'm talking, because usually I walk around doing presentations, but I can't because I'm double plugged in. Um, but um, it'll, it'll work out somehow. The, uh, what I want to spend a little bit of time on is uh, talking about, I think, four different things. Um, a, historically, um, how we we maneuvered our ways mostly poorly through issues related to genome editing broadly construed um, or gene editing. Um, I want to talk about why I think we're in somewhat of a new area of science, era of science rather, um, compared to where we used to be and, and why we're really bad at, at, at talking about it or still stick to um, old ways of talking about it, why that matters for, for CRISPR in particular and for technologies like CRISPR. I'll talk about some others. Um, and end with what I think is the need for for broader conversations that were echoed in that in the National Academies report um, that we issued on on human genome editing uh, in twenty in twenty seventeen. But let me start um, uh, from the beginning. So this is the Wisconsin campus where land grant, like you guys are. Um, this is eighteen forties, eighteen fifties, and uh, campus obviously looks completely different now. Um, this is actually my office up there. So that building on the top left-hand corner, um, you can't see that, but it used to be cheese making. So it was a bunch of guys, literally guys with mustaches, learning how to make cheese and making cheese in the basement. Now it's science communication. Um, and uh, that probably tells you a little bit of kind of where, where, the, um, where the priorities are. But Wisconsin is one of those places like Cornell and other land grants that still have a communication program in the College of Ag and Life Sciences. And a large part of that is the idea that back in uh, when, the, when the Hatch Moral Act was still, when Moral Act still uh, first came along, the idea that we don't just do work on crops, on, on crossbreeding, on all these things back then, but we also, in the direct language was, I think, we teach farmers to grow two blades instead of uh, blades of grass instead of one. So we don't just do the research on it, we also take this to the community. Um, and then I started at Cornell at some point as an assistant professor just after um, John Losey had published his BT corn study, that non-peer-reviewed uh, letter in Nature, uh, where he linked uh, BT corn to, to mortality rates of monarch butterflies, and of course also the flavor saver tomato, the now infamous star to, to GMOs um, with very little of a value proposition, um, you know, a, 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 a a type of tomato that didn't taste very good, but at least it lasted forever in your fridge. And I think that was began a, a, a fairly poor string of communication choices. Um, one of the most successful pieces of communication around GMOs was this, and this was on every single, this is actually the original, I took this from Cornell, at every single dining room table in the, in the dining halls, uh, Tony the Frankentiger, genetically frosted fakes and Frankenfood. And I'll come back to why this was such an effective campaign and why that communicated the essence of why of opposition to GM so effectively. That came back, of course, the idea of Frankenstein and a test tube came back in the, uh, when Jack Jack Venter inserted synthetic DNA into a live bacterial cell in 2010. And then when we rolled out the report on human genome editing, the idea that there are very different ways of looking at even the same Academy's report, um, that was the report. This was one piece of writing that came out and some of you know, Antonio's writing um, that basically said something that was the exact opposite of what we said, meaning um, designer babies is something where we drew a very bright red line and some media outlets um, picked up on that and some media outlets said the exact opposite. Um, and so again, this I think this highlights really nicely how complex some of these issues are and how difficult it is to, to, for, for citizens to make sense of them as they're looking at two pieces of coverage on the exact same day of the same, of the same report. So, why is that such a new problem then if it's always been like this? Um, I just told you this is, we've been doing this for a long time, but I do think that we're dealing with a new type of science. Um, and I don't just think that, I think there's lots of um, research that, that supports that. We're, I think we're dealing with a lot of the technical risks much better than we did in the past uh, and much more efficiently. While we were writing the report on human genome editing, um, research on off-target effects was developing literally by the month and there were new studies coming out and we had to adjust the report in terms of what the status was on, on the research. That's not the issue and it's not the issue most survey research suggests in most people's minds. They trust us to do the science well. That's not the issue. Um, what, the, what the questions are that are coming up are questions that have to do with 
do we have enough time to talk through some of the social the societal complexities the LAPD for example is using a, a program named <laughs> Palantir bus you uh, that's that's being used by uh, uh, or to, to basically uh, use your social media traffic, your social connections, your, your, your Facebook networks to identify the likelihood that you might commit a crime. So to identify pre-suspects. Um, and so if your friend that you, you know, exchange a lot of emails with or you do a lot of other things with ends up being arrested, you're much more likely to get pulled over by the police. You can already see what all the problems are with that, the mission impossible type of uh, problems. Um, but the, uh, the, the key issue here is actually the, uh, uh, the, the idea that we've that we're rolling out these technologies without us ever having had the chance to talk through them societally or their implications. A lot of them are not just things that we haven't talked through, but that clearly challenge our value systems. Um, chimeric embryos, things that are being done at SOC and elsewhere, um, that that challenge a whole set, and I'll I'll show you some of them and how that plays out in a second. But most importantly, they raise questions that we as scientists cannot answer with science. Um, AI and self-driving cars, um, good example. Um, neural networks and cameras recognizing people in Phoenix, Arizona and Tempe and still running them over. Um, this is work that people at Carnegie Mellon are doing on hacking traffic signs, for instance. Most cars on the road today, most self-driving cars interpret this as a 45 mile an hour sign. It's just a few white and black stripes on it. Right? it and, and which for every human, of course, is a stop sign, but for most self-driving cars, it's not. And of course, all of these cars are programmed to kill the driver under some circumstances, meaning we're telling people that there's a technology that if they buy a self-driving car and their children are gonna be in there, there's a very small slice of moral choices that this car is gonna make that will kill their child. There's a grandmother walking across the street slowly, there's a kindergarten class, I'm spinning out of control in black ice in, in Wisconsin, everyday scenario in the winter, that it may be the best moral choice to crash into a wall and avoid killing anybody else. So we're having huge societal debates around these um, fast moving issues that challenge our, our belief systems with little time to, to talk about them. And I think that's almost every single new technology that's coming up now from AI to CRISPR to whatever, whatever else. Our response to that is to fall back to a very 1950s model of communicating. That's been around forever. We call it the knowledge deficit model. We've all heard it. Um, it's basically the idea, and I'm putting somewhat unfairly Bill Nye the science guy there, um, but the person that an, an old white male with a bow tie who is really a caricature for scientists would be our model of how to best communicate with a highly diverse set of audiences is an interesting premise. I'm saying that expecting pushback later and, and we can talk about that. But the knowledge deficit model basically says if people only understood the science the way we did, they would make better choices and they would be more supportive of the scientific enterprise. The really paradoxical piece with that, and especially for those of us who do empirical work in this area, is that it's the one area of science where we refuse to believe in scientific evidence because every single piece of scientific evidence that we've collected on this model says it doesn't work. Meaning the more people know doesn't make necessarily a difference in terms of how supportive they are of the science, how willing they're to use the applications that come out of the science or anything else. That's why I use that little Lego zombie because somebody, this is not my, my terminology, I wish I had come up with this, call this the zombie of, of science communication. It doesn't matter how much data we throw at it and, and try to kill it, it'll come back up. And I promise you at the next conference that you go to where you talk about any of emerging technology, somebody's gonna say, we need to teach the public, we need to educate them better, they need to understand. All of which are normatively correct statements, but all of which are empirically not gonna translate into more support. Let me show you this, just one piece from embryonic stem cell research where we give in surveys, we give people quizzes, we ask them scientific questions and they can get six of them right, five of them right, none of them right. And I just grouped them into two different, um, and my, my pointer either gave up or it's the other one, we'll, we'll see, it doesn't matter. On the left, you see the, the people who are low um, on knowledge. So these are people that didn't answer a lot of questions correctly. On the right, these are people who answered most of the questions correctly. They just grouped them together for the sake of showing the results here. It's all controlling out age, education, all the other variables. And on the y-axis, you see support for embryonic stem cell research. Um, and so this is basically the knowledge deficit model. The people who have more knowledge are more supportive. Tricky part with that, that's only people who score low or who, sell, who rate themselves lowest on religiosity. People who self-identify as highly religious look like this. And it's they perfectly flatlined. The people on the right, that yellow group on the right here, oops, let me go back here. 
that yellow group on the right here is actually really important because they just answered all the questions correctly. They know the science. They understand the scientific facts behind embryonic stem cell research and its importance for basic research. And they still don't translate into more positive attitudes. And we see this, the exact same pattern across different scientific issues. So that's why I was saying earlier, the irony is that we're not being scientific in terms of how we approach science communication, which is really the only area of science where we're doing that, right? where we're basically saying we're ignoring all available evidence and still continue to communicate in ways that focuses on, on, on facts. Um, and of course, it's particularly interesting. I still am at the point in my life where I've spent more time in Europe uh, growing up than I have spent in the US. I think I'm one year away from being at halftime. Um, but I'm always looking at the US still with some amazement because it's a very different country than most other countries. Uh, this graph here plots on the x-axis the per capita GDP and then on the y-axis the percentage of people who think that religion is very important for them. And you can see if you st start at the top left, Pakistan, Indonesia, um, countries that have lower GDPs per capita, and as you go up all the way to the right, you see Canada, Australia, Germany, Britain, and so on and so forth. And if you haven't figured out yet where the U.S. is, it's literally off the charts, right? It's up here on the right. So the U.S. Is, is, has unbelievably high GDP per capita, but it's also up there with countries that are, that are much lower on that, on that scale. Why am I putting this tweet there? I'll show you two others, because I think we as scientists often um, communicate in ways that, that feeds the beast and that completely ends up being dysfunctional. Um, so this is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, on this day long ago, a child was born who by the age of 30 would transform the world. Happy birthday, Isaac Newton. Um, he tweeted that on December 25. Trolling Christians on Christmas is really funny in many ways, um, but it's not gonna open hearts and minds. Uh, when it comes to technologies that are, that are potentially deeply at odds with people, people's religious values, especially in this country. One of the most prominent, prominent climate scientists, Michael Mann, just got an outreach and communication award from the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, tweets that nobody who is a Republican in Congress is safe to have in, in either the House or the Senate. Again, if I'm trying to build bridges to conservatives who may not believe in the type of research that I'm trying to get them to believe in, this may not be the, um, the, uh, the best way of opening uh, conversations. And of course, Richard Dawkins, who never has a problem alienating um, audiences. Uh, this one on embryos and on, on, on fetal research. Again, we're, the, the, the policy buy-in that I'm trying to get for tissue engineering and some other basic research that is necessary um, to, to push scientific frontiers is not going to be helped with that particular type of conversation. So I just want to highlight some of the um, the potential, and I'm being totally unfair to these people because in many ways they're uh, good communicators for, for, for certain audiences. It's just that um, every so often those missteps don't really help. Why does this create a particular problem for CRISPR? Um, and I want to just show you some surprising, what I thought when we collected these data, um, surprising results from national survey data in, in the U.S. Um, so when we did the report, we were really concerned about germline editing. And that's really what the report reflects and, and where the re report really puts a stake in the ground and, and cautions and, and, and kind of outlines. Um, uh, and I understand that Alta Chara is coming out to speak here as well, so she can speak to that even more eloquently since she was one of the co-chairs than I can. Um, but basically we outlined a bunch of conditions that would have to be met for us to even cross that, that barrier, including broad public involvement. But when you actually look at public opinion, and we collected these data after the report came out, um, it's actually interesting that in it's interesting that in many ways um, the line that people draw for public opinion is really between therapy and enhancement rather than between somatic and germline. Uh, so in other words, they're 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 not opposed. Majorities are not opposed to germline editing if it's for therapeutic purposes, uh, and that's a really interesting distinction that that I wouldn't have necessarily anticipated in public attitudes at this stage. Um, so things are actually not bleak in the sense that there is, you know, broad opposition to things that may be important therapies that we're working on, um, even if it involves editing the human germline. Um, but there's some, some, a few other things that are, I think, important, and that is that CRISPR is just a, 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 an extension of some of the patterns that we've seen for previous technologies. So we take, for example, in a large national survey, we split that into three randomly assigned groups. And the reason we do that is so that one technology doesn't 
doesn't contaminate another so that answers, if you answer questions about nuclear energy, for instance, that wouldn't contaminate your answers on nano because you're still thinking about nuclear. So we basically randomly assign people and we ask them to which degree they agree or disagree that this kind of technology conflicts with their moral religious views or blurs the line between God and man. Um, and for nuclear, um, you can see it's a, it's a legacy technology, not really a lot of pickup on, on that argument on, a, on, a, on that scale, on that 10 point scale. But then if you go to nanotechnology where we're for the first time creating materials that don't exist in nature, new types of molecules, um, you, you can see the, the pickup going up. And then for synthetic biology, um, of course, it pushes it even further. CRISPR is just the logical um, extension in that, in, in the heads, in the minds of a lot of, a lot of audience members. And, and, and that's why this, this element of, of, of values and us communicating in ways that, that doesn't gratuitously violate or, or puts ourselves as scientists at odds with, with public values is so important. One of the areas where that can play out is, is scientific trust. One of the things that, that I think we, we argue very often is that, that the public trusts us less than ever before. That's factually not true. Uh, the National Science Board has collected since the 1960s public opinion data on public trust in science. Uh, there's only one institution in the US that outperforms science in terms of general levels of trust, and that's the military. And that's only with bumps after 9-11. After um, everybody is else is a below all the other institutions or they're declining the press Congress the White House the executive branch they're all declining science has not only not declined it's 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 the second most trusted source but that depends on on who you're talking to and this one in this one we asked in the same survey that I just showed you data from we asked people if they trust information the following information sources for for emerging technologies such as CRISPR um, and I'm breaking people down here into high, low, medium religiosity. Uh, these are university scientists, these are federal agencies like the FDA, these are religious groups, and these are other parents, for instance, when it comes to editing the, the genome of your child. The dark blue bars are really an important one here because um, they're the ones that almost, that are stable, I should have put error bars here, uh, but they're almost stable across, meaning for highly religious audiences, all of these groups have equal levels of trust. If those are the parents, if those are religious groups, if those are us as university scientists. So we have, we're not ahead of other groups um, when it comes to uh, being trusted as an information source. And, and that makes it even more important for us to be very careful is the wrong word, but to be cognizant of, of how, to, how to effectively um, open conversations and conduct conversations about this. Why? Because partly, the public, and by the public, I mean us, every single person in this room, um, come to this not as a blank slate, but with a lot of prior values, convictions, um, things that are important to us. Um, and since the 80s, we've actually done research on this in, psych, in, in psychology and in political psychology, but in science communication, we've discovered this somewhat more recently. Um, again, mostly because we haven't paid as much attention to evidence as we do in other areas of science. Um, but this is the idea of motivated reasoning. It's an old concept, and, and I, I always put these two here because uh, as, a, as a German, I'm always fascinated by how quickly this country rolls out the Hitler comparisons. Um, the top one is, is George Bush and standardized testing and education. The bottom one is healthcare. Um, so Obama was Hitler because he wanted a public option, uh, healthcare for everybody. Bush was Hitler because he wanted standardized testing and education. The last time I checked, neither education nor healthcare were really in the standard fascist portfolio. <laughs> but, the, um, but the point being, what is one person's healthcare is somebody else's fascism. What's one person's education standardized testing is somebody else's fascism. How does that work? It works by what some people have called in, in that field um, confirmation, disconfirmation biases. And you've, some of you have heard about this, right? I, and, but very often it's misinterpreted saying, well, people ignore facts. No, 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 that's not what it says. What confirmation biases say is if I line up 10 facts in front of you and we all agree those facts are true, we all agree those are scientific facts, there's no debate about them, each one of us is still gonna weigh more heavily those facts that fit our prior beliefs and values. Um, and we're gonna weigh, gonna weigh this confirmation less heavily those facts that don't fit. We're still acknowledging this too, they just don't go into our attitudes as much. Um, and that's what's called biased assimilation. 
And bias dissimulation is really very pernicious in, 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 in how it plays out because it basically says, I'm making the facts fit my value system. I'm assimilating the world, I'm assimilating reality to my values rather than the other way around. By technically, I should get new scientific facts and I'm adjusting my values, my belief systems. But I'm actually doing it the other way around. That's what bias assimilation is all about. And of course, I'm doing this because I don't want to constantly have my religion question, my ideology question, the things of what I believe is na are natural question, um, the, the, the yuck reaction that I have to GM crops and GMOs question. So what I do is every time a new study comes out that says it's safe, it's like, oh, it can't be true because it's funded by industry. So I don't have to, so I can basically motivatedly reason my way out of it. And we all do that all the time. It's not that this is them. Um, we do this constantly. The reason why we have some of the lowest vaccination rates in childcare facilities in the, in, the, in, in the childcare facilities of Cisco Systems and Facebook and Google and Silicon Valley is not because these people are not highly educated and trained in some of the best universities. It's because they use their motivated reasoning to basically continue to hold on to Wakefield um, and, and, and other studies that have been retracted because otherwise we would have to change our views of what's natural and, and so on. Um, but most importantly, and this is again where it brings us back to CRISPR, this is George Bush with snowflake babies. Right? So the idea that we, we shouldn't use leftover embryos from IVF that parents have consented to being used for research, we shouldn't use those for research, we should have those adopted. Uh, and, and, and parents should raise them as their children because look, this is what you could have if you didn't use them for research. And you can see how the same scientific fact or the same fact means very different things to different people depending on what value system they bring, they bring to the table. This is the, this is the tricky part of these emerging uh, technologies. This is the tricky part of what I started out with when I said they don't have scientific answers. I can't tell you what the answer is to this problem, to this moral dilemma. Um, let me show you one other example. It's a little bit closer to home. Our still governor, but soon no longer governor, Scott Walker, um, uh, cut $300 million from the University of Wisconsin system to give it to the Milwaukee Bucks, which is our professional basketball team, um, which is a communication battle. We should have won easily. That's what we did anyway. Um, and so what we, and what, what of course the university said, you don't understand because look, all this research, all this money you're taking, some of it is matching money from USDA and DOE grants on biofuels. You're actually taking economic value away from the state um, because this is economic value that goes from research that goes straight into the state. Um, and of course, yeah, that's kind of true, but it depends on what your motivated reason. And so we just happened to have a survey in the field at the time where we looked at, again, on the x-axis, information intake, you, you pay attention to a lot of news, um, or you have low information intake, meaning the more facts you get or the fewer facts you get. And then here on the y, I just plotted, do people see net positive economic impacts on the state or net negative impacts? And for Democrats, the more information they get, the more excited they get about biofuels, the more facts they get. And you can see where the white space is, so you know where this is going. Um, this is Republicans, right? <laughs> So two things that are really important here, A, well, maybe three things. A, nobody's right. Both of them take away from what they want, something that reinforces their, their, their predispositions. Um, number two is more facts. Don't bring people closer together or don't make them more pro-science. In fact, and this is number three, they polarize them. And the most polarized people are the people with the most information. So they're not the ones who are uninformed. Those are not the polarized ones. The polarized ones are the more science I throw at them and the more scientific facts I throw at them, the more polarized they get. We've seen this from Dan Kahan's work in cultural cognition. We've seen this from our work here at, at, at Wisconsin. Uh, we've seen this from pretty much every piece of, of evidence on emerging science. Um, so that pushes that knowledge deficit model thing even further because it says you communicate in a way that doesn't allow people to meaningfully connect what you're saying to their values, you're gonna create a problem and you're gonna create a problem where, you, where you're widening gaps rather than narrowing them. So all of that of course is, and that's just the last thing I, I will mention on this topic is based on or is complicated by the idea that it's not us talking to the public. We're just, that's just one diet. There are lots of other players um, in, this, in the communication space and GM crops is not an example, not, a, not an exception. Academy's report came out two, three years ago, I think, um, with uh, 
Fred Gould at NC State chairing this one, it went through 15, 1600 uh, peer reviewed studies to answer the question, are GM crops, genetically modified crops, any less safe to eat than traditionally uh, bred or grown crops? And, and of course they found absolutely no evidence to support that conclusion, uh, not a single study. Uh, there were other issues that they touched on that one can have a different take on, but the health effects, they, they were unequivocal and based on, on broad, broad scientific consensus. But of course, that was not the first or the last piece of communication. And now coming back to the Tony the Franken Tiger. Why is Franken as a, as a half phrase added to food such a powerful piece of communication? And the answer is because it gives me zero pieces of information. It doesn't teach me anything. What it says is it connects a scientific issue to a mental bucket that I have. And that mental bucket is Frankenstein. A scientist who does stuff out of pure hubris, puts stuff together that doesn't belong together, transgenics, that stuff gets out of control and we can't bring it back into the lab. And again, all of that happens because scientists could and didn't think about the, the social societal impacts of their work. And I said all of that simply by saying Franken because you've seen the movie or you've read the book. And it works. Because I gave you a simple, that's how we all process information. We put them on mental shelves, as I said earlier. Once the Franken food frame was established, it, it was there to stay. Um, and ironically, again, science tells us exactly how this works. In fact, Nobel Prize winning science, Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize in 2002 as a psychologist in, in economics, um, because he and his colleague, who unfortunately had passed away at the time, which is why they didn't share the prize, basically said, every single time we look at the world, we look at it through a particular frame of reference. We don't look at, 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 at the world with a blank slate, but we have all these mental buckets. They didn't quite say it that way, but that's basically what they're, what they're alluding to. And they said, well, science is actually, they said this is particularly strong as an effect if you have an ambiguous stimulus, where it's unclear what that stimulus means. Um, this is science as an ambiguous stimulus. Um, this is an experiment, you know, sometimes you, in social sciences, I'm sure in the bench science it's the same way, you see a study you're like, damn, I wish I had done that. This is the one that I wish I had done, but A, I wasn't born in 1955, and B, I probably wouldn't have been smart enough anyway, but this basically what they did is super simple design. They give what they call a broken B stimulus. So it could be a one and a three, or it could be a letter B. And it, this is stem cell research that's curing Alzheimer's, one and three, or it's killing unborn life, a bee. And I can completely set your frame of reference. I can activate a mental bucket by putting you in group A or randomly assign you into group B. And the exact same stimulus that's sitting in the middle is gonna obviously mean different things because I activated different mental buckets. That's what Frankenfood does. It basically says, you could think about GM crops about saving the world, vitamin A deficiencies. Um, you could think about a lot of different things. Um, you know, 10 billion people by 2100 that we need to feed, or you can think about it in the way Frankenfood um, would suggest you should think about it. So that's basically what they ended up winning a Nobel Prize for in, 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 in 2002, and since then has, has really be become a, a, a large part of how we understand communication effects. Um, and framing is something that's not misleading, it's not spinning something. It's something that, that if, if I talk to you and, and we have a conversation and, and I don't get my points across, I'm going to try a different angle and to get on a different mental, mental bucket. Right? So it tells me why should I pay attention to an issue in the first place. There's lots of issues today that I should be attention, paying attention to. Why GM crops? Why CRISPR? Why science in the first place? Um, and so that's why we see a lot of these war and conflict metaphors there's a great piece that, uh, that Matt Nisbet, who's now at Northeastern, and Dominique Broussard, who's in my department, and, and, and Adrian Krapsch did, where they show that for stem cell research, for instance, there's lots of research, lots of coverage that never got any pickup until the political conflict started in Congress, and hearings started, and press releases started coming up. And all of a sudden, coverage started picking up, and everybody started paying attention to stem cell when it became conflict-laden, and everything was reduced to embryonic work, basically. Um, so, that's part of the problem, framing something early and framing something in a way that, that, that makes a value proposition is, is, is crucially important. It tells us why I should take the risk if I see a risk. Right? Why, should I, why should I support editing the human genome unless there is a value that pays off and that I see and that, that's relevant to me and to my value system? And basically, why, how can I connect 
applications of that science to my own personal belief systems. And I just want to use climate as an example because climate, I think we've run into the ground as an issue. Um, it's almost not salvageable. Um, if you say climate change, most conservatives are going to tense up and, 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 and not listen to you. And that's, there's lots of research on that that shows that the word climate change doesn't, doesn't work for them. But Mitt Romney, before he was forced through you know, 13, 14, 15 primary debates into a weird stance on climate change when he ran, actually had a really good approach to it because he basically said two things. Um, well, three things. Premise number one, I'll never talk about climate change because my constituencies don't like it. What I will talk about is, is global competitiveness. The Germans um, and Europeans have been investing in, in, in green energy for a long time, and they will sell it to China eventually, because China will need it every summer. You see Beijing under a cloud of smog. Somebody will make a lot of money from that market. If you want it to be the US, being a global player and, 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 and being, being competitive in that market, um, you need to invest in green energy not because of climate change, which I'm not even mentioning, but because of a value that matters to you, global competitiveness, US global competitiveness. Number two, energy independence. You don't wanna fight wars in countries that you can't pronounce and put accurately place on a map, and you don't wanna send your children to die there. You need to invest in green energy, renewables, not because of climate change, not because of the environment, not because of any of the things that politically you don't like because they started with Al Gore after the 2000 election, but because of values that matter to you. So can I basically make a, a embed the technology in a way that resonates with the value system of a, of a group that based on the science itself would be opposed to it? Ultimately, my outcome of course is this, right? I don't want people to drive 12 cylinder cars. Um, it, they drive them around by themselves, but not because of climate change, but because of the values that go into global competitiveness and, and, and energy, energy independence meaning values that are actually important to them and across the political aisle. So let me just add with one last thing, and that is the, uh, because I do want to make sure that we have some time to chat as a group, um, but, and that's the need for some of these broader conversations. And I think we've heard this from lots of different communities, including bench scientific communities um, at this institution as well. Um, and that's the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, data from, from the same survey that I showed you earlier. Um, and we basically asked a couple of questions here. One is, um, is the scientific community on the left-hand side, is the scientific community capable of guiding uh, the development of new technologies in a responsible way? Um, and again, I'll show you the breakdowns here in a second. And then the question, if scientists should consult with the public, if they should have these broader conversations. Um, and again, breakdowns by religion, and you see clear differences here and breakdowns by knowledge, it goes almost in the opposite direction, right? The more knowledgeable you are, the more you trust the scientific community to be able to roll this out in a responsible fashion. The more religious you are, the less likely you are to think that the scientific community can do this. But in spite of these rifts here, we see fairly broad agreement across both. The most highly knowledgeable and the most highly religious both think that scientists should involve the public in broader conversations, which echoes what the report says. Uh, the, the Academy's report says, it says we need much broader conversations than what we've currently built into the approval process with a recombinant DNA advisory committee at the FDA and other processes that are really, I would, I would personally call fairly minimalist as far as public opinion and public involvement is concerned. But of course, all of this we're doing in an environment that I've just described in a fairly depressing way, right? And a, a highly polarized information influx produces even more polarization. So how do we do this well? And, and Alan Leshner, who many of you know is the former CEO of the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, um, I think has spoken to this uh, quite powerfully about this open bi-directional dialogue that we need, this, this kind of engagement. But usually that's where the quote ends and people leave out the second part. And what he actually talked about is both about the perils and the pitfalls. Um, um, or the promise, but also the perils and the pitfalls. So in other words, if we're having this broader conversation, we do need to expect questions that are not just about the negative parts of the science, but also about areas of the science that have societal impacts, political impacts, and we need to be ready to have answers. Um, that's not our field as bench scientists, but we're gonna be asked those questions and to simply say, well, we don't have a scientific answer to that, so that's not a relevant concern is exactly what got us into trouble with GMOs. It's what got us into trouble with, with uh, um, embryonic stem cell research. It's what got us into trouble with tissue engineering and a bunch of other fields. Um, 
So what, one of the things that we're working on right now, and, and, and we just started, uh, and Lee and I were talking about this before um, on an NSF grant, uh, that we're just starting out on trying to new, uh, trying out new ways of, of engage, building engagement that, that minimizes or depolarizes the debate. So that doesn't produce that widening gap as people learn more, they, they move further apart. But actually, how can we get them to, to use the scientific facts that they need to have a meaningful discussion and still come together and not necessarily end up in the same spot, but at least in a spot where they can have a meaningful conversation about some of those values. The piloting that we did on this was actually with university students. And what we did is um, we know from social science that one of the strongest influences uh, in our daily lives is not wanting to make a fool of ourselves. That sounds really weird, but this is the reason why I'm wearing skinny jeans and a tie, right? There is no rational reason for this at all. Why did we ever come back to skinny jeans? I have no clue. Why am I wearing a strip of cloth around my neck? I have no rational idea why that is, but one does it. And I look around, everybody else does it, so I'm wearing skinny jeans again. And at some point, they're going to get different again, and my shirts are going to get wide again, even though they're tailored now, and so on. Why? Because everybody else does it. So one of the things that we know from psychology is how important group pressure is, the ASH experiments of the 50s and 60s. And there's been lots of interesting work at Penn and elsewhere that says, can we get people out of their motivated reasoning by, by giving them the impression that somebody else is watching them? And so what we ended up doing is we ended up putting students, this was for nanotechnology, putting them in an experiment, basically four different um, randomly assigned conditions. So condition one is, um, here's a bunch of information on nanotechnology. Afterwards, we're going to ask you questions. Period. Number two is, um, let's start with this. Um, here's a bunch of information about nanotechnology. Afterwards, you will fill out a questionnaire. And then we're going to have you discuss with other people. They never had to have the discussion. We put them in a discussion so they wouldn't go away and tell their friends in the subsequent rounds of experiments that they didn't have a discussion, but the discussion was meaningless. Then here, discussion with people that disagree with you. We told them explicitly that people will actually have an opinion different from you, and here people who will be similar to you. And then we allowed them to go into what's called a gated information environment. It looks like an online set of articles, um, but it, really they can't go outside of it, so we know exactly where they spend time bunch of articles in three different groups, general news, science and medicine, and then editorial and opinion. And the animation already came up, and that's the important part here. Um, the editorial and opinions are the two-sided ones. So who goes to basically information that disagrees with their previous attitudes? Um, and if you compare the numbers in the red, meaning the percentages that actually go to the two-sided information that potentially contradicts their viewpoints, meaning they don't engage in biased assimilation and motivated reasoning, every number in there is larger than the 15.4 that you see for the no discussion. So just threatening undergrads with the idea that they will have to talk to other people that disagree with them is, makes them go and, and look up that information. But by far the highest number is for the opposing others, meaning where they know they will have to talk to people who disagree with them. So part of the solution clearly lies in something that we've forgotten how to do well in, in filter bubbles and echo chambers and online environments that just feed us what we already know. Um, but that's where some of the mechanisms lie in, in, in building around the how can we create diverse enough discussions uh, that hopefully bring or work around some of that motivated reasoning. Just as credit to my two co-authors and co-PIs on that grant, uh, Mike Zenos, who's a political scientist, and Dominique Broussard, who's a geneticist and a PhD in communication from, from Cornell. Um, so they're both part of, of this project. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I, 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 I want to just do one pitch really quick, because we're, we're, uh, if, if people are here to work on this, we're, we're just collecting articles, hopefully, uh, uh, for a March 15th deadline for a special issue environmental communication on genome editing and uh, in agriculture in particular. So this of all places uh, would be that, and especially, I mean, obviously issues related to public perception, to risk perceptions and so on. So for the social group in particular, um, hopefully there may be something relevant in there. So I left exactly 11 minutes um, for Q&A. Hopefully that is enough. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate um, you inviting me. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to. Um, so a, a couple of things on that. So one, a somewhat surprising finding from that survey um, that we're just writing up now, and that is when it comes to applications of CRISPR for wildlife and, 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 and ecology, 
Um, and I would not have anticipated that, but that's actually where the dial really, or where the needle really goes up for the public um, seeing it as unnatural, which is really strange in many ways, right? Um, and, and Matt Nisbet, who I mentioned earlier about this, the, the study that he did on stem cell research, his dissertation at Cornell was about what he called the yuck factor. So this idea that a lot of us approach GM with this idea that it's just, it's just unnatural. It's something that we don't like. Um, Bill Hallman at Cornell in one of, at, at, at Rutgers in one of his surveys showed that in, in surveys, typically people engage in huge social desirability effects. They don't admit what they don't know, right? They pretend that they know things they don't. But even in, in his surveys where you would assume a huge, huge social desirability effect, when he actually asks people, so why don't you like GMOs? They basically openly say it's a gut reaction. I just don't, I, I don't have any good rational reasons. I just don't like it. Um, and I think for, for wildlife in particular, that is something that we really need to be aware of. The idea that CRISPR applications where you would assume, I don't know, we can save the American chestnut, right? This is, of course, why wouldn't we do this? Um, and the answer is, well, because in wildlife, it's actually, and it, this, the needle goes up much further than it goes for human applications, which is bizarre. Right? You would assume that putting it into your body is something that's much more problematic for people than, than de-extinction, which is an extreme form, but you know, maintaining certain kinds of wildlife or, or plants or other things. So that's one. But number two is, I think from, from nano in particular, um, I think there is no one public reaction. Uh, and one of the things that we saw for nano is we asked, for example, people what applications they most associate with nanotechnology. So we asked long batteries. And then we correlate that with, with risk perceptions and see if risk perceptions in those areas translate into attitudes. And you see, depending on what you're in your mind, you most connect with that technology is what drives your risk perceptions. So it's not an objective assessment of risk. It's a, it's a relative one for all of us, meaning what is most accessible and easily retrievable from memory is what you're going to drive it. Um, and so I think for CRISPR, we're going to have the exact same dynamic. And in many ways, what our surveys pick up on right now is a broad conversation about therapeutic applications and Huntington's and Tay-Sachs and whatever else. What it's not picking up yet is I think a lot of the applications that maybe with a much less clear value proposition for patients early on uh, or later on. Um, and I think that's where, where the dynamics are gonna be interesting and I think that's where we're, we're gonna need the most work. I think in, in contrast to GM, where I think our value propositions from the beginning were not just poor, period, they were poorly communicated. Um, I think in CRISPR, with CRISPR, we're in a better spot, at, at least in the human application side in the beginning, that that's really the domin what's dominating the debate. But I think that'll change as we're seeing other applications, especially in wildlife. And our data really are beginning to show that, 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 that agriculture is the other one, uh, where I think we're, especially in Europe, um, we'll see some, some dynamics that, are, that, um, that, that we'll see spillover effects from from previous technologies and, and it's not gonna be pretty. That's just gonna be my prediction. And not pretty, I, I don't mean that in terms of us. Our job is not to push technology some, down somebody's throat. By not pretty, I mean um, dynamics that are just at odds with the best available scientific consensus. Sorry. No, 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 I think actually, oh, oh, I'm supposed to repeat the question. So um, um, for, for um, for uh, especially applications in, in agriculture, is there a value in, in, in highlighting differences between new gene editing techniques and, and, and uh, previous techniques um, uh, in terms of transgenics or other things? Or, uh, and and, and I, I don't have a really good answer, so my answer is still a little bit guessing because we, we haven't done, or I, at least I don't know if there's empirical work on this. Um, I know what there's, so it's, I'm not sure how many of you have seen food evolution, and 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 I think that you know there's always been this argument that well we've always done gene editing. It's just been called selective breeding. There's good evidence that that doesn't work. Right? That and it seems like a really intuitive argument, but it it actually doesn't change anything. Partly because people see this as something uniquely different. So that mechanism would suggest that yes, your the answer to your question is yes. Meaning once we can point out that there's something about CRISPR that avoids some of the elements of previous editing technologies that people didn't like, that that would actually help. Uh, but I don't have any empirical evidence to say that that will, uh, my guess would be yes, but I, I just don't have any data to say yes, it will be. So, no, that's a really, actually, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> question about motivated reasoning and to which degree, which one drives which, right? Um, is, it, is, it, is it more knowledgeable people become more polarized or, or polarized people more knowledgeable? The data that I showed you wouldn't be able to answer that by themselves. Why? 
because they're cross-sectional survey data. So we really, they're really correlational. Um, those same studies have been done experimentally. Uh, so where you randomly assign people and you expose them to informational stimuli and then see what those informational stimuli do to, to, to people as they learn more. Uh, and it shows the exact same effect. So the, the causality is sorted out pretty well. Um, um, but, um, but based on, on these data only, your, your point is, 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 is well taken. Um, the, 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 the interesting thing, of course, about the, you know, the, the knowledge and polarization is um, that those are also the people, as we do engagement exercises, most often that we end up having in a room, meaning the people at both ends of the spectrum who really know a lot about the issue. Um, meaning, and for GMOs, I think we see this all the time, that we have a bunch of people who've read all the primary literature, who know every piece of financing that has gone into every study and every what they see as a conflict of interest because your lab has at some point taken money from seed company X. Um, and on the other hand, the people who really think that this is important for a variety of other reasons. So the, the, the people at the very end of that polarizing curve are also the two that will show up together in your public meetings and town halls. And, and so that adds, yeah, I'll go back. Okay, um, I'm going to try and repeat that and and, 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 and capture that. No, no, I appreciate it. Um, so I, I think the question is, um, you know, am I am I saying that communicating is should be moving away from from just simply a knowledge deficit and then and and rather frame issues in a particular way? And what does that leave for public? What room does that leave for meaningful bi-directional conversations, broader engagement, bringing stakeholder communities in? Um, and so I think a, uh, I, I, and every time I, I talk about the knowledge deficit, I think I overstate the case in the sense that I do think that information is crucially important. It, it, it's information is unless these public debates with or without stakeholder communities are meaningless unless they're based on the best available science. Um, and we've written about this most recently in a piece in the Stanford Social Innovation Review with Elizabeth Christofferson from the Rita Allen Foundation and Brooke Smith from the Calvary Foundation we basically call for that, saying we need best, the best available evidence in those broader debates. But those broader debates will be well beyond just the scientific facts. They will have to include values. Our job is to not, and this sometimes I get that from bench scientists, well, how do we get people to overcome their religiosity? We don't. It's not going to happen. Um, and it shouldn't. Um, very much like a lot of my values, I, I hold fairly sacred. Religion happens to not be one of them. but a lot of other values, if you communicate against those or you're trying to convince me that they're wrong, I'm going to close the door on you right there. So that's not our job. It shouldn't be our job, not normatively, not empirically. But it should also, we should avoid alienating some of those values as we, and this is why I showed some of the tweets. Um, because opening a conversation by saying, you're wrong and now let me tell you why. I mean, I don't know what your personality is, but for me that doesn't work. I mean, if you open it that way, or if you open it again, like, so your religiosity, I, I kind of see why you're religious, but let me tell you why you shouldn't take this into account ever. Um, so that's the, the, the that's just not going to work. So that brings us to the third one, and that is the, uh, broad public engagement and having these broader conversations. And I think those broader conversations, we often talk about a bi-directional dialogue. It's, I think, multi-directional, but it does involve one thing that we very rarely mention, that is listening. Uh, meaning actually listening to to viewpoints that we will as bench scientists strongly disagree with uh, That may not fit into the way we think about these technologies But the you know, I say this in my undergrad class at the beginning. There's no stupid questions in here um, And I think the same thing is true for those exercises, right? A patient um, Community will bring certain concerns and that will not always be what we think they are um, So we had this for example as part of the human genome editing committee the deaf community comes to us and says I don't want to be fixed I appreciate you telling me that it should be fixed and that I, something is wrong with me, but I don't think there's something wrong with me. And then the next question is, so what happens if some members of that community um, get a genetic edit for their children and others don't? Are we then dealing with, with hyper discrimination and so on and so forth? So that's why we have, need to have these conversations, I think, with the listening part being a large part. And that's also why I think we need to have this conversation, not just with the, I think patient communities are an obvious one. I think religious communities are an obvious one. Um, uh, groups based on race are already we're, we're talking slightly you know maybe less obvious uh, things I mean if you look at the chimeric embryos and oh this is violates the idea of evangelicals or of Christians absolutely but what if it's a pig embryo 
and an organ that's grown in a pig embryo? What about Muslim, Muslim communities? What about Jewish communities? So there's lots of questions that don't even come out until we have that honest dialogue. So I would, I would argue that we want to have that dialogue and we want to have it, but we do want to have it with the best available science and getting that in without constantly insisting that we're right and, 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 and figuring that out, I think that's going to be the, the tricky part. I'm going to shift over here just because I haven't taken a single question from here. So, yeah. Do we still have time? Okay. Okay. Um, that's a perfect last question. Um, the, um, um, if I did repeat it, it would be even more perfect. Yes. Where, you can, where can you get resources um, and, and training? Um, so resources, I think there's the, the National Academies is organized, and I was involved in all three of them, Sackler Colloquia on the Science of Science Communication. That kind of summarizes where, what, where the body of work is and what we know. Um, and they're all available. The first two are special issues of PNAS. The third special issue is going to come out in the next couple of weeks. Um, there is a report that Alan Leshner chaired um, on science communication um, that the academies released last year. Um, that's a bit more of a dense read, so for what that's worth. Um, um, but I think it's it's more uh, it is tailored at practitioners. Um, and then lastly, training um, opportunities. I think there's a number of different things that are. Uh, that are happening all over the country. Um, I just mentioned one example because Wisconsin, uh, we actually started a PhD, a transcriptable PhD minor in science communication um, that has grown tremendously. I teach a class in public attitudes towards science that used to be a, for social scientists. Now it's two thirds bench scientists. Um, it's basically a 10 credit minor for geneticists, for um, biophysicists, um, who will get a degree in genetics and it will say PhD minor in science communication. Um, and I think what's happening is that younger generations are increasingly, younger generations of scientists are increasingly seeing this as a part of their portfolio of what one has to do. And I can't remember who says this, said this, um, but somebody said at some point that progress in science happens one funeral at a time. And so I think science communication is not any different. I think we'll see a generational shift. I think we'll see a new outlook on, on, on how to, um, communicate about these emerging technologies as a new generation of scientists come up, and I think that's a that's a good thing.